Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jeff Bliss. I'm a senior editor here at the Capitol Forum. Thanks for joining us. Uh, this is our first panel, one of two today. Uh, positions staked out uh, by T-Mobile, Sprint, and deal opponents are well known by now. What we'd like to do with today's first panel is challenge these positions as they no doubt will be challenged uh, in court next month and see if we emerge with a better understanding of the decision the U.S. District Judge Victor Marrero will face at trial. We have articulate representatives of three main points of view on the merger. Rob McDowell has played a key role in T-Mobile's public defense of the merger. Debbie Goldman of the Communications Workers of America has helped lead the union's aggressive opposition to the deal. And Angie Cronenberg of Encompass <laughs> represents a prominent tech policy group group that uh, opposed the initial deal, but now supports the DOJ broker fix. So thanks to you all for participating. So Rob, let's just start with you. Deal supporters have told me that clearances by the DOJ and the FCC will be one of the main factors in the judge deciding this in favor of the companies. But unlike DOJ and FCC decisions on mergers past, these decisions are inconsistent with each other. They find different problems with the merger, and they have proposed different solutions for the merger. On top of that, the companies have always argued this is a pro-competitive merger and didn't need to be remedied. Won't these substantial differences raise a red flag to the judge who could be persuaded by the opponents who are more, at least more consistent and straightforward in their arguments? Well, thank you for having me, Jeff, uh, and thanks for uh, to Capital Forum for putting on this uh, terrific event. Looking forward to it, um, and it's great to be here. So, thank you. Uh, so, first of all, actually, no, those are both positives. So, you, uh, I, I won't speak for Judge Marrero, although I would like to. Uh, I'd love to just write his decision for him uh, if we even need to get to, to trial. But, um, but uh, you have two federal regulators uh, blessing this deal. Uh, they each have a different lens to look through. My old agency, the FCC, has the public interest standard, uh, and Department of Justice has uh, antitrust precedent. Um, and that is going to be two different perspectives on the deal, but both have green-lighted it with, with conditions. Um, so what you have in the Southern District of New York is a Section 7 Clayton Act case, and it's really hard to find. I see Seth Bloom and, and some other antitrust experts in the audience and the professor, but it's hard to find... A precedent for a Section 7 case where you have a Department of Justice and an expert regulatory agency like the FCC blessing a deal, and then, uh, and, and maybe there are some precedents out there. I see the professor raising his hand, so uh, it's, uh, maybe we can talk about it later. Um, uh, to where, where that has been successful uh, in a Section 7 claim, right? So that's a, a steeper hill to climb. The, the state attorneys general have the initial burden uh, to prove that this is harmful to consumers. And you uh, prove that by, historically anyway, uh, showing a reduction in capacity, reduction in output as a result of the merger. And proxies for that are things like higher prices. So what is, what is the consumer harm? Um, and what we have here, and by the way, I, I disagree with the premise that fixes or conditions were needed to begin with. Um, but you have uh, kind of belts and suspenders uh, approach by the two agencies of if you're not happy with it as just a clean, no condition deal, then the, the fixes are, are what's going to help here. And I know we're going to probably drill down more on the fixes dish versus other things, but you, the, the states have a, a steeper hill to climb because you have the two expert agencies uh, blessing it. Now, the FCC is persuasive and not controlling, uh, but DOJ um, uh, and, and their analysis, I think, will have a, a bit more weight to it, but there is a substantial amount of competition analysis in the FCC's order as well. Uh, so those are all uh, reasons, I think, why the state AGs will, will lose if indeed this goes to trial um, and uh, the merger will go through. I just wanted to one follow-up to that. Sure. Uh, one thing I, that I did find unusual about, the, again, the inconsistencies between the decisions, because usually these are pretty well coordinated. In fact, you've heard some complaints like, why do we have two agencies pretty much telling us the same thing? I don't know, you certainly, when you were a commissioner, um, <laughs> you well know right? right, exactly. Um, but, but just for an example, one thing they, one of the things in the public interest standard, standard is to look at competition issues, and uh, the FCC didn't see I have a problem for in this merger with, for example, um, coordinated effects. 
whereas the DOJ, that was one of the parts of the, of the complaint. So I'm just wondering, is, is, that, is that a problem? Does the judge look at that and say, well, these guys can't even agree on this? No, I don't think it's a problem at all because at the end of the day, both agencies approved it. But yeah, the public interest standard is broader. And, and of course, you know, by definition, I'm an FCC chauvinist. So I think the, their standard and their analysis is it would be stronger than DOJ's. Um, and when they did look at the, comp uh, the competitive effects, they said any, you know, th th they said any harms that the evidence is mixed. And then there's language all throughout the FCC's order regarding that. Uh, but, you know, just in case, we'll put these um, with conditions on it is essentially the, the spirit of it. Um, and then, so that there are the conditions. Uh, we can drill down more on whether or not you think those are adequate or not. But no, I don't think those are negatives. I don't think those, those detract from the, I think those are actually in, in favor of the companies trying to merge uh, in the Section 7 uh, case. Okay, I'm going to shoot it over to Debbie. Uh, Debbie, uh, CWA has been a strong critic of the deal since it was announced last year, of course. But eight years ago, uh, CWA strongly backed AT&T's bid for T-Mobile. Uh, which is a wonderful, interesting merger to cover, I'll say from a reporter's perspective. But some people have argued that that merger was more any competitive than this one. So I just wonder if you could reconcile for, the, for us the different views of CWA on those two point mergers. I'm happy to explain that. When CWA looks at a merger and tries to make a decision as to what our position will be for, against, or neutral, we look at what is the impact on workers, what's the impact on jobs, what's the impact on consumers. And I would emphasize working people and our uh, hundreds of thousands of members are consumers and um, also employed, about half of them in the industry, about half in other industries. In the case of AT&T T-Mobile, AT&T committed to bring back offshore call center jobs and to adopt a policy of non-interference should the 10,000 former T-Mobile workers seek union recognition. What I mean by non-interference is AT&T contractually with CWA has an agreement that if they acquire uh, a new company, they will in no way communicate to employees that their jobs are at risk, that they would have to close a store, close a call center, they have no retaliation, they stay out of it, like our National Labor Relations Act says they should. They stay out of it and let the employees have a free choice to whether or not to have a union. Our experience has been in every acquisition AT&T has made, the employees free from employer intimidation have actually chose to be a member of CWA. We don't know if that would have happened if this merger had been um, completed or not. But we saw this as an opportunity, which the wireless industry um, is uh, majority non-union. This would have been an opportunity to expand the union representation and therefore the uh, ability to have union standards become the standards in the industry as opposed to union standards always being needed to compete with lower wage and lower worse working conditions and no um, opportunity on the job. So that's why we've supported the merger. We also, and people forget this, in every comment, and I wrote them, that we made to the FCC, we also talked about conditions that would be in the public interest and that would um, include investment in next generation. In contrast, in this T-Mobile Sprint merger, we looked at the evidence and we saw that the overlap of the retail stores in particular and headquarters functions would result, we did a very careful economic analysis, would result in the loss of at least 30,000, of as, up to 30,000 jobs in the industry. And that abs, because there was no collective bargaining, there was no mechanism for workers to protect themselves in the event of a transaction. Finally, we also, began to look at some of the um, more recent antitrust literature about the impact of consolidation on workers' earnings and the fact that the increased consolidation in the economy is in fact one of the, not the only, but one of the explanatory factors for why we have flat worker in earnings in this country really since the 1970s. If you have fewer employers in the same way 
you have fewer um, uh, uh, companies, prices would tend to go up because of less competition, fewer employers, workers have less negotiating power. And in fact, we asked a think tank, the Roosevelt Institute and the Economic Policy Institute, two think tanks, to act, look at the data and see what they thought the impact of the T-Mobile Sprint merger would be on workers' earnings in the industry. Uh, they predicted that there would be a th up to $3,000 decline, downward pressure on earnings if this was a four to three national wireless merger. Now, I will say the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the way that they collect information about this industry makes that kind of argument challenging. But it was a first attempt to see. And certainly our members who work in wireless retail stores emphasize to us that this is a unique labor market, that selling mattresses is not the same thing as selling complex wireless services and packages. Well, Debbie, I can't resist it. Um, you're talking bringing up jobs, and, and you may have seen the press release that came across today from T-Mobile. Essentially, they are talking about putting 1,000 jobs in Nassau County in one of these centers, and they, of course, use it as a way of talking about these other things. What do you think of that? I mean, is that... Is that uh... They are trying whatever they can do to try and get General James to cave on her very important action in the absence of the DOJ really taking action to block this anti-competitive murder, they are doing what they can to try and get AG General James up in New York to drop her suit. It's not going to work. Be but let me just say about jobs, and that in particular, T-Mobile and Sprint offshore tens of thousands of call center jobs. The fact that they are trying to woo various states by saying we will put a call center with no commitments about what would be the compensation, about respect for workers' rights, the fact that they're trying to woo them with now there have been four announced call centers. That's 4,000 potential jobs, no accountability. They have not made that commitment to a regulatory agency with any oversight to ensure that that happens. But uh, they could be bringing back a lot more jobs from all those that are in overseas centers. Okay. Um, I want to get to Angie, uh, and I want to clarify, because Angie told me this when we were planning it, uh, she is a member of the group, correct? And um, Sprint helped form the organization that eventually became Encompass. And T-Mobile has worked with your group on certain issues, but you represent Encompass's views today. I want people to understand that she's not representing a specific company that she's worked with or is a member of the company. Um, here's what I want to ask you. Uh, Encompass originally opposed the deal primarily because it would affect the wholesale market. We were very, uh, I know you guys were very concerned about that. But one of the main concerns of the critics of this deal is um, it still leaves a big problem, in, in their view, in the wholesale market. And that's the new T-Mobile is going to be the main network in which those wholesalers will buy their access to. So I guess we just, how, why, how does the fix actually get you past that? Great, thanks. Thanks for having me, too. And maybe helpful to explain who Encompass is exactly if folks in the room don't really know. Um, Encompass is the Internet and Competitive Networks Association, and we work with our member companies who are both builders of fiber, fixed wireless and wireless, as well as content and video companies that deliver services over the top to consumers. So when we look at mergers, we're looking at it from a variety of perspectives representing our members' interests. And for we studied the Sprint T-Mobile transaction for a long time before we went out on the record about how we felt about it and what we thought about it. And a wholesale was a significant issue for us. Um, you may recall that at the beginning of the transaction, the applicants said that they would respect 
the wholesale arrangements that they already had and that they would abide by those agreements. And that's not a shocking take, right? Because they have contracts. I think T-Mobile's yeah. um, CEO didn't come out and say, yeah. I will, if anybody wants to come out to this hearing room, I will sign you up for the, all right. And we, you know, while helpful, we didn't think it really went to the heart of the issue, which was we were gonna have a transaction where we went from four to three networks and how that would then change the incentives of the parties to um, extend wholesale arrangements and offer new wholesale arrangements on the new T-Mobile network. So that's where we were coming from when we were originally looking at it and um, thought that you know if, we, if those issues could be addressed and a number of our members were talking to the applicants individually and then of course we as an association were talking to them and it was helpful to have one of the parties uh, as a member at that time and uh, unfortunately we weren't really able to get the issue addressed until uh, the department without the Department of Justice's help. So we're very thankful mm -hmm for the work that Macon and his team um, did with respect to this transaction, actually looking at the wholesale marketplace and its importance. So I would note the conditions that made us feel better about the situation was one, there is an extension of the wholesale arrangements um, and that extends for as long as the proposed final judgment is in place, which is seven years. So I think that's a significant benefit, um, one that our members are pretty happy about. And then um, also with respect to Dish's new place in this transaction, I think is also a really uh, helpful development. Um, they too now have an arrangement, um, and one that's quite favorable to that will allow them to do something that typical resellers aren't always permitted to do, and that is to build a, their own network and as they've built their network, be able to transition customers from the T-Mobile network over to their own 5G network. Those terms are pretty favorable, um, and they are terms that allow uh, DISH to be able to have more control of the customer than is typical in a resale arrangement. So the other aspect that uh, I think for wholesale purposes that uh, people sometimes miss in this transaction, and that is uh, the eSIM conditions that also the Department of Justice thought were necessary to really address um, a part of the market that we haven't seen a lot of development of this in the when U.S. You can automatically change. Yes, okay. and that's so. This is when you have a device and you can have a remote changes from who you're going to have as your service provider, and that I think is a really significant development from the perspective of creating more of an opportunity for there to be competition between T-Mobile and Dish, and vice versa, for them to really go after each other's customers, especially. Um, you know, it will help Dish not have to have stores in as many locations because they will be able to do more remotely in terms of meeting the customer needs when they need to switch uh, providers. So that's that's a really great development, um, I think, to to create more uh, retail oper new retail competition and um, by having that wholesale piece also addressed. So. Those are the things that I would highlight as changes that were made that were not in the original application. Uh, I get just again a follow up for you would be all right. What if, is there also a consideration of if they kept them separately that your members could have uh, negotiated even better contracts than you got in this situation, or was there, well, you know the a, the part. So the the applicants were making the case that together they're going to be able to provide. Um, a more robust 5G network that reaches more Americans than what separately they were going to be able to do. So, you know, I don't want to make Rob's case for him, but I think when you're looking at the totality of what, what's going to happen now is that we will have four facilities-based networks and we will have two of them, one of which already has wholesale conditions that are in um, as part of the final judgment, and the other one who I think is also going to be incented to provide wholesale access as well. So we keep that mark that structure of four, with two of those networks being just more friendly to wholesalers as compared to the entrenched incumbents in this marketplace. All right. Well, you gave us a nice segue into the efficiencies of this, and I'm going to go to Debbie because I know that she would love to talk about what the FCC order says. Um, basically says all this good stuff about the efficiencies. It says the combined T-Mobile Sprint 5G network will cover 88% of America's by 2025. That's 50% more than the, the, the uh, 
carriers could do by themselves, according to the FCC. The commission said the combined network capacity might be much greater than the companies would have if they remain separate, and that would allow T-Mobile to lower prices and expand output, which again is accepting a major part of the, the company's argument. And then the new table, T-Mobile will have so much ex excess capacity that will offer new fixed in-home broadband service for millions. So those, those three points, that, that's exactly what the, um, the company's been argued that was accepted, at least in the order. Sounds great. What, what, what's the problem? I think it's important to look at the dissent that uh, Gen uh, Commissioner Rosen Russell wrote. She acknowledges the critical need for mid-band spectrum for U.S. leadership in 5G, and we would agree. But she also, at the same time, critiques the FCC policy failure to get more mid-band spectrum to market. And she says that this particular merger is not a solution to that problem. It's the wrong solution to that problem. In fact, she says, eliminating a fourth nationwide wireless carrier will and now let me quote, make it less likely that carriers will invest in 5G, especially in rural areas, because, as she explains, it takes away the fuel that fires competition and powers greater deployment. The FCC's commitments try to fix the very problem it creates. The public interest would be better served if the FCC pursued alternative paths to enabling 5G without this merger including making critical mid-band spectrum available at auction. In other words, the FCC has alternatives to getting more mid-band spectrum out there than allowing an anti-competitive, price-rising, job-killing transaction. And the DOJ settlement does not resolve this problem. I think that's the crux of what we need to be talking about here. And in my view, you have to believe in the tooth fairy to believe that DISH will become a viable nationwide fourth wireless competitor. We've already heard from the professor that many of the conditions that move it from what he calls a brand, we call T-Mobile's uh, uh, newest uh, uh, customer, it will take seven years. DISH is not in good shape. It has been steadily losing customers. It's highly and increasingly leveraged, much more leveraged than Sprint, with significant debt maturing soon. Analysts predict the DISH will have difficulty meeting its debt obligations in 2022 and may be forced just for that to go back into the um, raise more, more debt. Moody states that DISH's June 2021 $2 billion maturity is below cash flow capacity. And according to Charlie Ergen, DISH's CEO, they have no financing in place to build these networks. And analysts have remarked on DISH's comment that they can do it for $10 billion, which is what a Verizon or an AT&T spends in one year as just silly. So to think that DISH is going to replace the competition that is lost, and therefore that solves the problems of getting 5G out there, which I would add, T-Mobile has announced they're going to have 5G to 200 million people by the end of this year. Sprint has deep spectrum, is already has 5G in nine cities. So it is not the only way in which we accelerate 5G. Okay, well, I'm going to, um, if, if, Bob, do you want to? There's a lot there, actually. Uh, so uh, a couple things, if I can just uh, go back to some earlier so first of all, it, uh, just so Debbie knows, I was a dues-paying member of the AFL-CIO. I belonged to two labor unions. My mother was a union. My sister was a union. So I have a lot of uh, sympathy and empathy. Um, by the way, your blouse is beautiful, and it's almost magenta, so there's hope for you, I think, <laughs> when it comes to this deal. Um, so a couple things. So you said at the very beginning. But I don't have a different one for every day, including a different <laughs> pair of shoes for every day. And I'm not negotiating no right now with WeWork to get a new job. <laughs> and your hair shorter. <laughs> you have shorter hair than John. But anyway, um, so you said something at the very beginning, which was, uh, and I was at the commission at the FCC during AT&T T-Mobile. I never put out a statement because I never was presented with uh, something to vote on. Um, but which was... Uh, you had the opportunity there to expand the union base. Um, 
And that's absolutely true. And that AT&T had the uh, non-interference uh, standard uh, or sometimes called neutral vote. You know, if T-Mobile were to offer a neutral vote, is that something that would be, look at that smile, you just smiled. Is that something that would change your mind? Because you, you started off your whole discussion talking about there's gonna be a threat to union jobs, which I totally understand. You have two non-union shops combining. They'll still be the number three carrier, but there's the potential for them to take customers away from two union shops. AT&T and Verizon are both unionized. So that is, from your perspective, from CWA's perspective, you're losing maybe dues paid members as a result of this competition. But if that third member were unionized, then you might be for the merger. Because with AT&T T-Mobile, that was number two buying number four to make for a number one carrier, right? Which it's hard to reconcile that with saying that number three buying a number four that I would argue is actually not a nationwide carrier, but we can have that discussion in a minute. Uh, it's still number three. It, and so, but it would continue to be non-unionized. But if I got a phone call right here from uh, John saying, you know, a neutral vote, would you change your mind? We would love to have direct conversation with John Ledger about respecting workers' rights at T-Mobile. So is that a yes? <laughs> you change your mind? You heard it about the suit. Stuff. So, because the, the 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 discussion <laughs> initially wasn't about antitrust or competition. It was about how many unionized workers are there going to be, and I think that's an important point in all of this. So, and but that's also something that Judge Marrero is probably not going to look, look at. Gonna right? yeah. It's going to be outside the scope of, of the trial in the Southern District of New York. But I just wanted to kind of uh, discuss that for a minute. Um, the same opponents to. Um, this deal were also opposed to another deal when I was at the commission, which was T-Mobile Metro PCS. Mm -hmm. So uh, the same opponents, including CWA, and that was non-union buying non-union, uh, said there would be job losses, uh, the prices would go up, especially in certain markets like Miami, um, et cetera, et cetera. And actually, the number of jobs ended up being tripled in that one. And that was not an easy undertaking, by the way. Uh, it, the network integration was uh, accomplished ahead of schedule and under budget, in part due to the brilliant uh, Neville Ray, who's the T-Mobile's CTO I'm a big fan of. Um, and so the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. And I, I think it's important to note that all those doom and gloom predictions by antitrust analysts and, and others uh, not only didn't come true, but the exact opposite happened. Prices went down, consumer satisfaction went up, more jobs were created more stores were open, right? So that's important to uh, to bring out here. And then as we segue into what you really wanna ask me next, no. which is to look at this still as two to three or now two to three plus one. You have an industry where you have two carriers in a top tier, you have uh, Verizon followed by AT&T, number one and number two. They have the vast majority of the market share and over 90% of the free cash flow in this business. Then you have a distant third, which is T-Mobile and a more distant Fourth, which I would argue is actually an urban and suburban carrier in major markets, not a nationwide coast-to-coast -coast carrier. But for argument's sake, let's assume that it is uh, the number four and somehow it's equivalent. So what you're, you're doing by shooting down this merger, if that were to happen, is to preserve this two-tiered approach. The two companies standing alone cannot clean up, first of all, Sprint's sickly balance sheet. We have over $42 billion in net present value that will be cleaned up as a result of this merger which will liberate capital, make it easier to raise capital, to spend more money faster. And in some cases, there'll be union jobs, maybe not CWA jobs, but in some cases where you're building, you have construction jobs that are unionized, uh, depending on the, on the jurisdiction or where you are. But you're going to be spending more money more quickly than them standing alone. Sprint would have to borrow $25 billion. It is already buckling under its current debt load. It is losing subscribers. Uh, Marcel has done a good job of temporary fixes by cutting costs, but he's been cutting CapEx and uh, trying to acquire new customers because their churn rate is not good, but the, the customer acquisition costs are very high. So there's a short-term fix, but long-term problems for Sprint. They cannot build a nationwide coast-to-coast -coast 5G network. He has said so both to Wall Street and under oath on Capitol Hill and at the FCC and the DOJ. Uh, so combining the two, uh, we'll still leave you with number three. That will uh, be a better competitor to AT&T and Verizon who will have a competitive response. And we've already started to see it just by the threat of this, uh, this deal happening. 
Um, so they will accelerate their CapEx. So we will literally get to the 5G future faster as a result of the deal. Then, and I'll try to wrap up in a minute because I promised you I wouldn't filibuster and I'm trying to be as concise as possible. But then, so you have the new T-Mobile spending $60 billion over the next six to seven years or so on a brand new shiny 5G network, right? Which increases capacity, increases supply, but you have an they have an incentive to fill that network up with paying customers. Those two carriers, Sprint and T-Mobile, have been the most wholesale friendly, to Angie's point, of, of all the carriers. Right. Um, and that will continue. That DNA doesn't go away. That's part of the business strategy. So the notion that somehow DISH is uh, going to be frustrated by the new T-Mobile is actually totally counterintuitive. You want to start bringing, up, bringing in revenue from really any source that you can. Uh, and, and the DISH wholesale arrangement is part of that, which, by the way, the, not only are the terms seven years, but they're enforceable four years after that. So 11 years from now, or 11 years after closing, um, someone could still sue in federal court, uh, and unlike any other wireless merger, uh, to enforce the terms of this deal. So there's a lot there. I'll try to wind that down now so no, I can no, ask no, your no, next I, question. But there's there's a lot out there, and, and I'm happy to drill down on it. Well, I would, well, I was going to say I'm going to give you a chance to respond because this actually segues nicely into a comment that. Uh, I decided that one. Yes, I was we, <laughs> talking about this. Um, that in <laughs> that encompass was part of a letter that was written. I think it was back in February or March. Um, this is before you guys came out for the deal. Almost before the dish, of course, the dish fix was done. Um, this is from this this letter. This is talking about the future of five G. The parties, meaning T-Mobile and Sprint, of course, have staked their case on the notion that their combination is necessary to unlock the value of 5G deployment in the US, but the parties can deploy robust 5G networks without this merger, and both have already begun to do so. So I guess, is that, I mean, so you're disagreeing with Rob, or is that you still, you guys still stick to that, or, or what? Um, so I think that the applicants, you know, made their case, the Department of Justice and FCC have both looked at it, they've come to their decisions about uh, what that looks like. We agree with the Department of Justice and where they have landed on this. And that is allowing the parties to go forward to do what they feel like they need to do to be most successful, but then also recognizing that a fourth network is still needed in the United States, that having four competitors that have their own facilities is a good thing for consumers. So that is what we agree with. But I, I did want to go back while I'm not here representing yeah. Dish's views. I think it is important and to respond to Debbie's uh, points that she was making on whether or not DISH really can be successful in the effort of deploying its own network. And so I wanted, I, and I also think it's important, as, as the commissioner was saying, to look at history. And history is often a guide uh, for what we can expect in the future. And I want to note that DISH has a history of being a disruptor in entrenched markets. From the moment that it you know, launched a satellite to compete against the entrenched cable operators back in the 90s, to the work that DISH did to ensure that they would have access to local broadcast stations so they could compete more directly against cable was incredibly important, to recognizing that when you're delivering new video services to customers, that digital was the way to go. And then what happened? Cable operators responded. They upgraded their analog systems to digital. That's really fantastic, right? They have this history of disrupting what's happening in the marketplace, and that is what DISH is going to do to the wireless marketplace. Um, is it going to be hard? Of course. Is it risky? Yes, of course it's risky, but it's really exciting to see the opportunity for DISH to be able to enter the market and be a full-fledged 5G facilities-based network through this process. And they will attain, you know, about 9 million subscribers that are the Boost subscribers. By the way, don't you love that name, Boost? It's going to help boost them into the wireless market, right? It's a good thing. And then they have, you know, 12 million video subscribers right now that they can help convince, hey, don't you want a wireless product from us? So that's a really great opportunity for them to grow their business. Um, and offer consumers what it is that they want. So I think it's, uh, I wouldn't undercut Charlie Ergen and Dish so easily. Well, let's let's go to Debbie on this. I've actually, it goes under my next question. Debbie, um, 
we know that Macon Del Remo, that the DOJ isn't the first guy who put faith in Charlie Ergen. I do know that people in the government, especially at the DOJ, um, in past administrations, have all have exactly seen Dish as a disruptor. And they, they there was talk about getting them into the wireless business some way earlier than this. Um, he's he also there's Sing Sing TV and all the rest. So what's what is isn't he the perfect guy to bring in at this point? Be the disruptor? Why not? Di disruption is shaped not just by personality, although that plays a role. Capital is important too, but critically, market structure is key. So the DOJ took a look at going from four to three, and to counter what Rob started with, the DOJ said this merger would result in three equally sized companies, and therefore not only would there be anti-competitive unilateral effects, there would be anti-competitive coordinated effects. So the kind of disruption that T-Mobile, with, by the way, $3 billion from AT&T and lots of spectrum that they got when that transaction was turned down. That helps you be a disruptor, by the way. But that Ledger led after the turndown of the merger. By being the dog nipping at the heels of the others would be fundamentally different after this transaction. And the DOJ recognized that. In terms of Charlie Ergen and Dish being a disruptor, I have to beg to differ with some of the facts. He has been hoarding Spectrum now since 2008, and with this deal, is under no obligation to build out with his existing Spectrum, much less any divested Spectrum, for another number of years, putting some of that Spectrum that has been laying fallow now, by that point, could be up to 16 years. Charlie Ergen is the one who tried to game the FCC 600 megahertz auction by creating these phony small entities, trying to save $3.2 billion there. The FCC and the courts turned that down. So I don't have the same kind of, we're in a different situation here than when Charlie Ergen entered to fight the monopoly uh, cable industry. I know that Rob wants to go. So, if I can just to... build a, a little bit uh, while we're talking about DISH. So uh, a couple of things. Um, DISH has spent about $20 billion uh, acquiring Spectrum. And Debbie's absolutely right a little while ago saying that um, their uh, core business, their DBS business is under pressure, it's under stress, right? So this avenue, when you talk to Wall Street analysts especially, which I do, and you do, uh, this avenue is the avenue uh, out, the avenue for growth for the, the larger dish uh, universe of, of companies. If you're looking for economic growth, this is it. He has $20 billion you know, trapped that's not being monetized in Spectrum right now. He's got, that's got to start producing money. So this is the way to do it. He has the best wholesale agreement anyone has ever seen in the U.S. wireless industry. Have he you has seen access. It? To, I've seen the accounts of it, uh, <laughs> and he has access to uh, terrific spectrum. You know, we haven't talked much about the blend of the spectrum, but the unique low, mid, and, and high band spectrum that the new T-Mobile will have. So that's urban, suburban, and rural areas uh, that are just beautifully satisfied, unlike any other carrier. Um, and so when you look at all that together, there's a huge incentive for DISH to build out this business. And to Angie's point, you'll have the Boost wireless uh, business uh, customers already, plus his existing subscriber base. He'll have 20,000 cell sites um, uh, that'll be divested to him, as well as 400 retail locations. So that right off the bat is a huge boost uh, to uh, uh, to kickstart uh, this this competitor. And then real quick, I want to touch on uh, prices too, which we haven't had a chance to drill down on, and then I'll, then I'll let you talk. Um, which is, we, we haven't talked about the difference, what makes this merger unique? And unique is a word that is often misused, both my parents were journalists, and so unique means one of a kind, not unusual, so one of a kind, can't be very unique, therefore. So 
wireless is unique, right? You like that? Uh, there's some grammar, grammar uh, nerds in the, in the audience who appreciate it. But um, as we pivot to 5G, we're going to see, uh, first of all, this, the immediate efficiencies in 4G of this combination is at least 3x by the most conservative estimates. You're going to see exponentially more capacity because of 5G. So what that means is you're having much more supply, by the way, at a lower production cost, also for 5G, one of its benefits. I can't think of a perfect analogy of another industry where every few years, let's say once a decade or so, uh, wonderful engineers produce technology that enables an exponential uh, spike in the production of the thing that it is that you sell. Uh, you could say computer chips with Moore's law, but it's not the volume of chips, but that's, that's a pretty, pretty close analogy where computing power doubles every couple of years and the price is cut in half. So if you were to, let's take the most conservative estimate of, I don't know, 5X for 5G in the short term. If you were to have five times more milk on the market, what would happen to the price of milk? It would go down. Or five times more of anything on the market and the price is going to go down. So that capacity and the efficiency argument are rolled into this. This is something that I've, I've seen this argument for a while. I'm just wondering, as a business person, yep. why would you build so much capacity and then want to sell it for low? Why would you want to do that? Well, you're, you're, you, they are have been. So you've seen consolidation in wireless, yet you can continue to see ARPU decline, right? So why is that? Because consumers are consuming madly. We have an insatiable appetite for wireless. And the Internet of Things is going to continue with that. We can't even foresee all the implications. So the price will get so low. Right. Well, you're still going to be able to make money, absolutely, but the production costs are lower. So it's like, you know, after a while, selling like chewing gum. I mean, you can say there's a commoditization, and we could, that's a whole other panel we could have. I'd love to have that. I'll come back tomorrow. <laughs> um, but I uh, could talk about what, what that means. But, but it's a very exciting if you're a consumer, because we do have this insatiable appetite. I was there at the FCC when we were uh, setting up the auctions for what became 4G, and nobody, none of the best and the brightest, foresaw all the applications in 4G, the app economy, for instance. So nobody saw that. Nobody called that. Go look at the literature. Uh, so we don't know. That's the exciting thing about 5G. We don't know all the wonderful things uh, that are going to come about as a result. So uh, the point here is, though, that that creates immediate downward pressure on pricing, uh, and as well as the competitive response that I talked about earlier. So I just wanted to point out those two things. Okay, I was going to say, I know that Angie wants to say something, but I want... But I feel like we've moved on, but I'm sure yeah. maybe I'll get it off. Well, I was going to say, I want to, um, I, I want to, because we, we are not, we are really, we're going at a pretty good pace here. Uh, I, we're doing okay. We have, a, we have a few more minutes, and we're going to try to leave a little time for audience questions if you have them. Um, Pro Professor Quokka made some really good points about this fix. I just happened to go down and look to the, you know, before we went here, uh, to the proposed final judgment that just the DOJ. So this is just what will have to happen, the DOJ says, not so much the FCC. So there are even more conditions. These are, and this is, not a, this is not an exhaustive list. DISH must offer a nationwide postpaid service within one year of closing the sale on prepaid assets. DISH must implement strict firewalls to protect competitively sensitive information. T-Mobile and Sprint must take no action to, quote, jeopardize delay or impede the sale of cell sites and retail stores, which you mentioned earlier. Um, the companies can enter the transition services agreements covering a number of services, including billing, customer care, SIM card care purchases, and so on. Again, point. There are a whole bunch of things that have to go right for this thing to work. He made the point is like, how's that all going to happen? I, I haven't seen many um, remedies like this in, in my career, and I've been covering this for almost a decade. Why should we believe this is going to work? And they have a monitoring trustee, too. Right, right like, they do. That monitoring trust is never going to sleep. And it. there's <laughs> teeth. And there's teeth in terms of, you know, billions of dollars at risk if they don't meet the requirements. I think that's the case, you know, for all the parties involved okay. and um, and then of course dish also has you know its own specific obligations as a meet for build out or its licenses could be yanked um, it could be held well, responsible that, right like there's a number there's a well, number let me, of let me things, ask you number that. of remedies that could happen if the parties don't abide by the well, judgment you, as well as if they don't meet the op their obligations. Right. Well, Commissioner Rosenworcel kind of gave like kind of the nightmare scenario for the people who oppose this deal. Basically, that dish says, I'm not going to build out and basically takes the hit on $2.2 billion and I'm not going to do the $10 billion build out and then just sell the second. I mean, I would just be honest. I really don't understand that argument at mm -hmm. all and having to um, the commissioner, he did such a nice job like talking about why it is that dish is so incented. Like, 
Why they already they have that? a lot of investment, right? They Why would you strand $20 need, billion right? dollars like, in Spectrum? They have this need to move into a new market. They were already planning their IoT network, right? Like that was already in process. So I, I think it's, all right, so I think that, it would be bizarre, you know, not to for really all the do this. To, to, to yeah. go out. Okay. All right. But I just wanted to get that cleared up. I, I didn't want to cut your answer short. I just wanted to, but is yeah, there, yeah. Is, okay. All right. So did, um, Debbie, did you want to talk about all the, the different parts of the, the, the fact that a lot of people said this is an overly complicated fix to the DOJ? Did, did you have anything to say about that? I had a response to Rob that I have totally forgotten since. <laughs> You're going to say I give up. I give up. <laughs> <laughs> Let me get my phone. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Well, why don't we move on, I guess, then? Um, all right. Uh, let's talk about, like, in terms of uh, the towers you were talking about. I mean, there's some specifics here. They were supposed to give no fewer than 20,000, but I've talked to many experts in the industry who say you need at least 50,000 to, and I I know the companies are aware of this, and I know that I like to just get this response, though, in terms of what, I mean, there is this, I think the companies, T-Mobile and others, know that DISH is going to need more than 20,000 towers to be national, right? Is that Well, and, and sites, so uh, small cells, right? So and with 5G, you know, especially in urban areas, millimeter we have probably so that's not macros necessarily, right? So you're going to need more, and there's going to be all sorts of leasing opportunities, and the tower builders are eagerly awaiting for this deal to be consummated <laughs> so that they can get to work. Yeah, I mean, just, so last week I was in Louisville at the Encompass show where we have a number of our members and non-members who participate. It's a trade show, and Dish was there. Um, and they have formal RFPs, you know, already out gathering uh, the information that's needed about what's already in the marketplace. So there's it's, so there's already excess capacity, right, that is available. But then in addition to that, we have a number of members and non-members who are ready to build. Like there's a lot of pent up opportunity here uh, for the industry as a whole who are building networks. Um, so I think that while there's a lot of hard work ahead, uh, it can be done, and uh, you know, there the skeptics. Yeah, I think we should all just wait and see, rather than just attacking um, the conditions themselves. Like, oh, well, it can't be done. Well, we don't actually know that it can't be done, and the parties have agreed to these conditions, and have agreed to them when they have significant teeth if if they fail. And then there's also the oversight opportunity, right, to make sure that the conditions are being met. Jeff, yes, I remembered what I wanted to say. Well, can I, a question, because I mean, she brings, uh, this is kind of a second part of what we said before. Charlie Ergen's a smart businessman. He was one of the most, I mean, his company was one of the most vociferous opponents of this deal until this fix came about. They were pretty loud about it. They had a lot of so on and so forth. He signed this deal. And so he knows that, you're right, some of these things are not public, but why do we assume that he wouldn't have his own best interests? I'm not assuming he doesn't have his own best interests. Okay, okay. um, he can flip the spectrum in the future. He was under enormous pressure to build something by March 2020 with all that spectrum he's been hoarding. This gives him breathing space. He has a lot of options. I want to respond sure. to a couple other points. Rob, about price. I've heard that argument from the applicants. I sat through days of California public hearing in which I heard that argument. The FCC, which ultimately did approve the merger, rejects that argument. The DOJ rejects that argument. The state AGs in their complaint say that this will amount to a $4.5 billion increase in cost to consumers. So just because there is excess capacity, the dynamic of setting prices is very much shaped by the competitive forces in a market. One can have lots of excess capacity, one provider, or three collusive providers, and there isn't the pressure on downward pricing. Or there is a pressure on downward pricing because of the capacity, but maybe not as fast or as much. So the Bobby, applicants where were you have during been the BDS proceeding. Pardon? 
where were you during the BDS proceeding? Right. I, I mean, it's... I was with you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we were with you. Yeah. <laughs> no, we weren't. We weren't. Yeah, we you weren't. Were not. I'm sorry. <laughs> we were not. But let me, and let me make one more point about all of the conditions. We can remember just a few years ago when Comcast and NBCU were given permission with conditions to merge. And one of the conditions had to do with where Tennis Channel and Bloomberg were going to be placed on the cable roster. These are two, particularly Bloomberg, very well-resourced companies. And it took them years to get that condition actually uh, implemented by Comca the new Comcast, the merged Comcast. Well, so all of these conditions, and we did the arithmetic. This is a 40, the synergies that the applicants project is $43 billion. The merged company's revenue will be uh, above $100 billion. If you add up the penalties, even if they are on top of each other, that is an infinitesimal amount of, it, of the amount of value that these companies are projecting that they will get from the merger. And if you look at some of the conditions, one example, we've looked very closely at the, the commitments around rural deployment. It still will leave tens of millions of rural households without access to the high-speed 5G. But how is that condition going to be implemented nationwide? How does one determine, are you going to do drive tests in how many locations to determine if the promise of 50 megs to X number and 100 megs to X number is met? We don't know. The wireless Bureau will come up with a mechanism. We've looked at what the California commitment is, and it's one drive test per cell site. Well, you could do that drive test right next to the tower. I'm very skeptical that all of these conditions can be enforced, and if there are penalties, of which we've seen very little enforcement from these agencies and how difficult it is, even if there are penalties, it only is a drop in the bucket compared to the value that merge this anti-competitive merger will lead to. Uh, well, you uh, was shaking his head during some of his comments. So please well, thank you. Wow. Um, <laughs> blank check? No. Excuse no. Me. Uh, so first of all, back to the, the point about uh, FCC rejecting the capacity and efficiency argument. That's just not true. The FCC talked about a static model. Uh, I like to challenge premises of, of a lot of the conventional wisdom of, of this particular merger, merger because a lot of analysts are looking at this as if it's a smokestack industry from 1934, and it's just not because of all of the differences, the unique nature of 5G. Um, but we're in a dynamic market, not a static market. But the FCC actually rep, uh, did uh, recognize the capacity and efficiencies of, of 5G. And if you look at the FCC, it's, it's, it's reluctantly putting on some of the conditions. Uh, in part, as part to your earlier point about what about the coordination with DOJ, um, and that was you know, the FCC went first, and that was in, in part, I think, to pave the path for, for DOJ um, and to put in some behavioral conditions that Macon Del Rahim very publicly said he didn't want. He likes only structural uh, conditions. So there's a lot going on there. Uh, to Debbie's point, I mean, who's going to enforce this? Competition is the best enforcer. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly what we're going to have here. So you could have government officials drive testing, or you could have consumers drive testing. And if the consumer isn't getting their signal, if it's getting dropped or they can't pick one up, they're not going to subscribe. They're going to go to the other carrier that, that uh, does have a signal in that particular area. So there are, by the way, there are other testing regimes uh, to do this, other mechanisms for testing, uh, for build out. And you will have that trustee that is appointed by the court. And this is very unusual uh, and enforceable in federal court rather than filing a complaint with the Enforcement Bureau of the FCC. So this is a, a completely different ball of wax from, let's say, uh, Comcast NBC Universal, which I worked on when I was a commissioner. So I just wanted to uh, spit those out. But this is not a static uh, market, and a lot of the criticisms of it are looking at this as if it's a static market and say dynamic market, and almost every day it changes. I was just, um, we have a little time for uh, audience questions. Is there anybody who uh, wants to go ahead? Question? 
I got more if they don't. John Make, old Bloomberg colleague, how you doing? Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. um, Jonathan Make with Communications Daily. Um, I guess for all the panelists, um, we've seen, I guess, four states so far um, have announced that they're getting additional jobs um, from the deal, and some of those states have um, signed on to support the deal rather than challenge it. You know, it, it seems like it's successful so far. Do we think we'll see more of these uh, church announcements before the um, court hearing? And if there's no more questions on that, uh, thanks. I guess that's for you, Rob, or is it? I'd hope so. There are still 16 states, I think, involved with the state litigation, and I hope all 16 give up before December 9th, <laughs> uh, because actually this merger will bring jobs to all their states uh, and also increased efficiency and happier consumers. So there are a lot of reasons those state AGs ought to just forget about it. <laughs> Debbie, I assume you have a comment, and then I want Angie to talk a little bit about the very bad stuff. Oh, for the re for the reasons that Professor Kolka and I gave, I think that the state AGs have a very strong case. I am not aware of any more that would be peeling, but I wouldn't be aware of it. Um, and of those, uh, I think that uh, T-Mobile and Sprint's 330 economists and lawyers and PR people, and I probably am not counting high enough are aggressively having know. meetings right now <laughs> to try and convince the states. But I've looked at the deals in Mississippi and Colorado and Florida, and they're really uh, still leaving many, many people outside of the build. So those commitments are um, still relatively weak. and. Uh, in contrast to, as General James said, this price-raising, job-killing transaction, I don't think you're, I, I think the state AGs have a very strong case. From my members' perspective, there's a lot of build opportunity now, not just with respect to the new 5G network of the original applicants, but also now with respect to the new DISH 5G network. Um, and Charlie did speak at our show last week, and one of the things that he discussed about the network build is that building a new 5G network, they're not going to have the cost of the having to transition from other generations right over to the fifth generation. But a significant benefit is um, a lot of the technology can reside in the cloud, too. Um, and you may know we represent several large cloud providers. So we're talking about not just opportunities with respect to the physical assets, but also with respect to the software assets and the cloud assets um, that can be used in a, in a new way that's more efficient. Okay, I think we have time for one or two. Oh, yes, back there. that weren't true, there would be a Jones Jones of 150% of these things that get built already. So that's not on the table. So with this merger, the new T-Mobile is going to be the largest competitor of the wireless carriers from what I understand. And uh, that means with all three of you competing at about the same level, means that nobody has a real incentive to break out of the box as we DISH doesn't provide, uh, with, with 9 million prepaid subscribers, which is, uh, Professor Kulka said, is a low profit, high churn business. You have people who can leave that, uh, leave the new group, and um, they don't have any other real asset. How does that, how do you think DISH is going to replace the that's 
prohibition from the home home and setting foot in on the so there's actually two parts to that. One is, uh, so Sprint, you don't see them going bankrupt. That actually has not been part of the case, right? So, but the question, it's in the atmosphere, right? It's a backdrop, certainly. But the the, the question is, uh, from the FCC's perspective, is, uh, well, let me, hang on, I'm going to answer your question because you have multiple parts to your question. So I'm going to get to each facet of your question, which is Sprint can't compete in 5G. It just can't. It's in nine cities. It stopped at nine cities. It can't go further than that. It doesn't have the capacity to raise the capital to build out nationwide in 5G. It just doesn't. That's under oath. It's in the record. It's in Wall Street. It's Capitol Hill. It's everywhere. So that's number one. So this isn't this nationwide fourth competitor that's on equal footing with AT&T, Verizon, or even T-Mobile at this point. It's a much smaller and sicklier fourth competitor. So the fact that it may or may not file for bankruptcy is kind of irrelevant. Um, but they all have an incentive to, to compete. So you have, we've talked about before, DISH with a $20 billion spend stranded investment in Spectrum that needs to generate uh, income. DISH needs to have growth. Its DBS business is flatlining, right? So this is its one avenue for growth. We're going to see a rising tide in the 5G ecosystem economically anyway. So the rise of Internet of Things and things we can't really foresee that are being developed in labs all over the world. Uh, and that's going to help all of them. Um, and then you, you're going to have T-Mobile with uh, the $60 billion spend over six or seven years. Again, it's got to, it has an incentive to fill up its pipes. It's got to pay its creditors back when it's borrowing that money. And so the ways to do that is to, A, attract customers, either retail or wholesale, and have them stick. So T-Mobile's done a fantastic job of reducing its churn. It's among the most, I think it is the most competitive in terms of stickiness or churn. Um, and so how do you do that? But by keeping your, your customers happy, right? So the DNA of, of T-Mobile won't change with the new T-Mobile. It has been a disruptor. It got rid of term contracts. The rest of the industry followed, for instance. It, it uh, was the first to have real unlimited uh, usage. The rest of the industry had to follow. Those are just two key examples. So the incentive is there's a lot of stranded capital out there, which will not uh, be paid for, won't be paid back, unless you get happy paying customers on your network. Because they don't have the money to expand. You just explained it. Um, actually you know, we've heard a lot about. Yeah, I was going to. Well, what, what you're describing, though, is a universal service issue that, you know, the policymakers also have a role to play in addressing um, when there's not enough demand in an area to build network. You know, the Communications Act provides that the commission should address that issue, and those issues are being addressed. You know, the the interesting thing about this argument that Sprint isn't going to be able to grow and it would die and it's a withering, who's the owner of Sprint? <laughs> SoftBank. What's Masasan doing? Losing money. He, he's pulling the chair and the CEO of Sprint to be working to save where you work. Are they focusing on building the business at this point? Or are they focusing on what can they do to help Masasan with WeWork? Are they focusing on how to get this merger through and therefore it helps them in a certain odd way to have some floundering going on? This is a company who has tens of thousands of leases on towers, tens of thousands of MIMO microcells. They have 40, 50, I'm sorry, I took off my glasses, 54 million customers, only 9 million of whom are the, <laughs> are the prepaids. Um, they have a lot of assets and such a deep uh, uh, Spectrum, which of course is what T-Mobile wants from this transaction. So this is, as you said, it's not a failing firm. 
and there is not only from their own corporate owner, SoftBank, a way to get, yes, he's losing money at this point, but he could be pulling, putting in money and building the 5G and making this a very, very viable company, and there's other access to capital. So I think that argument, to think that DISH is going to be able to replace all of that is just a fool's dream. Okay, I, I think we're, we're gonna have to wrap it up. This could go on for quite a while. Thank you all. Uh, can oh. I end with like one quick thing? I would just note that LSU lost to Alabama for eight years in a row and just won against Alabama at Alabama. So, you know, I be really careful about how you predict this is really gonna turn out. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much.